What effect the uncertainty that there is at the moment is having uh, on, uh, on these invest investment decisions? And I think for the committee, if, you, if there were any concrete, specific examples that you could give us of that, rather than just saying we're all worried about it, when, rather than if there's anything specific that you can point to, for example, are sales being affected by Brexit, or indeed are there other factors which are affecting that which uh, are over and above Brexit? If I could come yeah. I mean, I think the first thing to say is that we are fortunate in the aerospace sector, which our global market is growing, um, and, and therefore our focus outside of Brexit is actually on um, ramping up uh, production, increasing production to meet quite challenging uh, demand out, out in the wider marketplace. So for most companies, they're looking very closely at what their capability and capacity are. Um, I think that Certainly, anecdotally, all of the conversations that we've had from people is, you know, they're, they're already making decisions that have a life beyond March 2019, so they're already having to make some, uh, or take into account some factors, um, and that will unquestionably, um, or is making them look at where that additional capacity and capability should go. It's quite a challenging marketplace. We've got lots of countries around the world who would like to have a bigger share of, of our aerospace industry. No, Sorry, no, I, I mean, yeah, again, so, you, you'll appreciate yeah, that, so, that uh, people don't tend to, to give you all of the evidence. One specific that we can, or I can give, is that a number of businesses who are doing, uh, working on uh, space projects, like the Galileo project, have, in order to bid for work, have to specifically uh, indicate where they would locate their supply chains post-March 19. So it's a particularly a very hard example of where UK businesses who have done extremely well from those space programs, and we have the largest space industry in Europe, are having to make decisions or give, give indications of where they're going to reallocate that work in the event that we leave the European Union in March 2019. As a learned body, we have to be a little bit careful about not being industry aligned, clearly, because we, we need to be neutral. Um, the example I have had uh, is actually the same as Paul's in that uh, in the, uh, the Galileo in particular, um, where uh, we have been very successful up, into, uh, up to date, but we have had companies now reporting to us that they are being excluded from um, bidding for contracts on Galileo. Um, the, although uh, membership of the European Space Agency is not part of the EU discussions because it's not an EU body, Many of the contracts, including Galileo, are EU funded and it's a requirement that the companies that participate and get funding for there and bid for contracts uh, have, uh, are part of an EU country. And so we're already seeing contracts being turned away from UK industry because of the uncertainty. Do you, do you use just-in-time um, processes for your manufacturing? And if, if you do, then what's the, what would be the impact of customs delays on production and your competitiveness? So the big issue for us on customs is what we call the non-tariff barriers. So it's a, it's a little bit like movement of, of parts across the channel, um, of which we have a huge number every single day. Um, we have this amazing aircraft in Broughton which flies our wings called the Beluga aircraft. It's called that because the front uh, of the aircraft opens up and the wings go in. It's really important. That has a two-hour turnaround. We have several of those movements a day, so we really don't need any customs paperwork or bureaucracy getting in the way. As we said in our evidence, um, civil aircraft is not going to be impacted by tariff barriers because of a WTO agreement, but it's the non-tariff barriers, the potential bureaucracy, the customs burdens, uh, and ensuring we get the paperwork right. Now, we're a company that's quite large. We have people who can manage these things. What we're more worried about is the impact on the supply chain. Both Gamma and Boeing, when they, in their evidence to us, said that certainty was needed by, at the very latest, at the end of March, next year, 2018. Um, is that your view? Otherwise, if that doesn't happen, then contingency plans, decisions will be made and changes and all of those sorts of things. What, 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 what's your, each of you, what's your views on, on what, what is the timeline? What's, what are we operating to here? When do we need to make a decision? So when does things need to be decided by? From an ADS point of view, we have made very clear to government that we would like to have, and our members would like to have, as much certainty as early as possible. Ideally, this is around a, an implementation or transition. Can you say period. a little bit more about that, Paul? What it actually is, so by early 2018, what does ADS say? No, no, what, what we, we've said is that we would like, um, you know, 
there, there's a number of stages in this process, yes. unfortunately. But certainly we are looking for some kind of formal recognition from the UK and the EU that we are going to have an implementation phase, however it's determined. Um, ideally, we'd like that before the end of this year. Um, but the end of 2017? Before the end of 2017. Yeah. And certainly, you know, early, as early in 2018 as is possible. Because, you know, people do have to make decisions around their businesses and ensure that they have continuity. Again, some of the penalties that you know, Rolls-Royce and or Airbus might impose on late suppliers means that they can't afford to wait until they might know what the outcome is. So in the absence of in, an, an implementation phase, the only thing that's certain at the moment is the most extreme, which is you know, we leave without yeah, any without kind of deal, deal yeah, yeah. which is clearly not... That's nonsense, is it? Is that, that, that's really desperately bad news if there was a no, no deal. No deal would be the worst possible outcome from, from an industry yeah. point of view. You know, we believe that would be chaotic and unhelpful for uh, this particular sector and, and a range of others. If you can imagine, so as I mentioned, we're, you know, aircraft manufacturer, engine manufacturers, a long cycle business. So, you know, to, to, to a certain extent, you can't chop and change your supply chain in a relatively short period of time because there are a whole um, raft of regulatory activities that constrain that. Um, there are other activities, so most notably things that we do in terms of the repair and overhaul of aircraft where we might be supplying replacement parts, which are much more shorter term. So those companies, or companies involved in those aspects, will be looking very carefully at where they're, let's say, warehousing their spare parts to say, well, if, it's, if, if, we, we, if it looks like we're going to face additional costs to shift things out of the UK, then we may be better to establish um, a, you know, a mainland European base. If there's concerns about the regulatory regime in the UK, they may decide to relocate some specific activities to uh, an alternative European base. So there, there, there are things that people will move and can move on a shorter time period, and the things that you know that are more difficult and on a longer time period. Can I, um, I suspect we're going to deal with regulatory and a, a different question later on, but yeah. there, there is actually a hard, there is a timeline there where there is a, a date. So um, the regulatory regime is not just Euro it does not just affect our relationship with our European partners. Because all of our relationship with the American regulatory regime is through EASA, then there is also a significant impact. There are 170 repair stations in the UK which are licensed by the FAA to supply American aerospace. All that licensing is done through EASA, through the equivalents of EASA. I've spoken with the FAA, and their, their view is, unless they know by January next year which way we are going to go in terms of January 2018, which way we're going, to, we're going to go in the regulatory regime, they will start the work to assume that we are not going to be a member of uh, EASA and therefore they will start the work to recertify their, because they can't afford the interruption to their own aerospace. That will put costs on them, so it will uh, significantly sour our relationship with the US, but it will also put costs on our own suppliers who will have to go through recertification which is currently done through the answer on behalf of the FAA. Uh, in the Florin speech, the, uh, the Prime Minister said uh, a possible two-year uh, implementation <coughs> period. Do you see that proposal as satisfactory for the aerospace industry? So we were very uh, pleased to see a commitment to a, an implementation or a transition phase. Um, uh, similarly, the, the idea that it was going to be on, on sort of status quo uh, terms, for us also reassuring. Obviously, the challenge is reaching agreement with our European partners. We are very keen that there is only a one-step transition or implementation. That's to say, from our current conditions to the future ones, and, and having a clear, um, if you like, a, a clear period for us to implement that. So, two years is a good start. Two years is certainly better than the, than none. Um, you know, whether that is sufficient will depend on what the final deal looks like. I think that the, the, for us, though, status quo means retaining our membership of the EU during that period. Okay. And that's important, for, certainly for our sectors, because much of our regulatory framework is shaped by our membership of the EU. Once we cease to be a member well, of the Prime Minister is not saying that. She's saying we're going to leave the EU and leave the customs union. Yeah, so, so, so that's why I'm kind of 
putting a marker down here, Good. which is... You're one step ahead. Right. I was going to ask you that. <laughs> is, is that the reason why we wish and we think the best outcome is to stay an EU member state during the transition is because we have a whole series of bilateral agreements that would have to be negotiated and in place at the moment that we cease to be an EU member state, which, in, as, as it's laid currently, would be the end of March 2019. Is that, is that shared by the others on the, on the panel? Yeah, I mean, it, the, the remaining single, in the, the EU. The single market uh, operates well for us at the moment. We don't want to suddenly fall off a cliff edge. So the EU withdrawal bill would not, would not be a good thing from your point well, of view. It means that, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, what it means is there's a whole series of activities that need to be done by the time that happens, which means that we won't have a one-step implementation. We will have a two-step, which is that whatever arrangements we, we can make by at the end of March 2019 and then whatever comes next. So, you know, and, and you know, this is not, whilst it's technically quite challenging and you know it's, it's, it's not difficult work if you know what I mean so what, what we're looking at is uh, as an example when, when we cease to be an EU member state we're not part of EASA so you know unless we know what our relationship is going to be that's quite problematic but at the point we become effectively a third country we need to have uh, a bilateral agreement with the US with Canada uh, with a number of other countries in order to continue our business so that, mean, that means work that it should be happening now if, that, if that's a hard day. So for us, it, it opens up two sets of uncertainties. Uncertainty as to what might happen or what might be ready by the end of March 2019 and then whatever arrangements we may have in place uh, for the longer term relationship. I think two years long enough for you. I think the, two years long enough. There are a number of instances where history would say that two years is a very, very ambitious target to make some of the changes. Uh, come back to the regulatory environment. Um, when we, the, how we got to the, Euro, the European agency we have today, we went from what was the Civil Aviation Authority through a, an interim phase called Joint Airworthiness Regulations. Um, that took five years. To, and then, even then, EASA had a fairly rocky start, so you know, seven, eight years. That was with all the expertise actually being pulled from existing bodies. There is no indication, and if anything, there's negative indications, that all our expertise that is currently UK expertise is vested in EASA will want to come back. Professionally, it doesn't make sense. If you're working in a global body, there is very little attraction professionally to come back to a a body that's got smaller scope. So we would almost have to start again. And those resources are, are really not there. And I think the CAA would, would feel very nervous if they were asked to stand up even in two years, start even two and a half years if you start now, would be very, that's a very, very ambitious target to rebuild the capability uh, to do those sorts of things.